Welcome everybody. This is the third and final salon for the Bella Pox series, which has been so generously uh, sponsored by Jeff Ludder, who's staying next to me, a really wonderful friend. Uh, he's the director of the San Francisco International Piano Festival. And Jeff, why don't you say something about the festival and why you think these salon concerts deserve to be on your Oh my festival. God, no. <laughs> I'd love thank, to know. Thank you, thank you, Gwendolyn Mock, for sharing these brilliant programs with the festival. There's no one else who would do them or who, or who would do them so beautifully. So it's a real honor for us to be able to co-present um, these programs. Um, the San Francisco International Piano Festival is turning five this year, and um, we've actually just um, received our final approval for 501c3 status, so we're kind of growing up and going out into the world as an organization. Um, and uh, this past uh, festival that took place in August, um, Gwen and I performed at the closing concert, and the, the season really looked at the influence of the Baroque uh, on French composers in the 20th century, particularly through the lens of World War I, the Spanish flu, and the advent of the Roaring Twenties. Um, all of those things will play into today's program in, in different ways. So it's, uh, it feels very natural and, and just a great gift to be able to participate in these with you. So thank you. Well, we're thrilled to be a part of this incredible festival, which has been chosen over many festivals as one of the best festivals among 20, I think, in the world. So uh, that is to your credit. And I, I was very honored to be a part of it. So thank you for having me. Um, the first two concerts, which we already uh, recorded, actually also featured some of the graduates of our program at San Jose State from the School of Music. I am particularly proud of these students, all my students, but in particular these students because they have really uh, gone on to really significant careers. And uh, so they're being showcased. I, I think it's very, very important for uh, the students who are now currently at our school to see where they can go. Um, the other thing I thought is so critically important is to also share with them a way to show music and showcase music in beautiful settings like this. And so I really have to thank Russ McClure. I don't know where he is, he hates being thanked, but in any case, he's a great friend, and so I really want to thank him. As I can see out of the corner of my eye, he's running away already. So um, and Russ and I have known each other for many, many years. We're, we're kind of like siblings and we argue a lot, but he has collected a really amazing a number of paintings and sculptures uh, and it, every time I come to the house, I'm knocked over and I notice new things and he's always amazed because he thinks I'm a complete ignoramus, which I am. But um, we've had a lot of fun curating the concerts around his collection. And uh, t today is no different. You will see a wonderful interview with Russ and Mayumi, who is the curator and the director of Color Galleries. Um, and they're talking a little bit about World War II because many of the pieces in this collection are more from that period on. And many of the painters here, including John Drillo, this big yellow, which I've decided I want, you know, um, he went to fight and then came back and got a scholarship and went to art school and he became a great painter. So whether it's World War I or World War II, it's it's of no matter. I think the important thing is we're interested in seeing how musicians and artists work during times of crisis. What do they produce? What comes out of them, you know, during and after? Um, the Tombo de Kukran, which is our first piece that we're going to play, is a work that Ravel wrote in 1914. Now, Maurice Ravel was already at that point in his late 30s, and he was desperate to join uh, the, the army or he really wanted to be a fighter pilot and um, nobody could believe that this famous composer wanted to be a fighter pilot but he had this dream uh, maybe he, he read the Saint Exupéry I don't know I, it's very hard for me to tell but in any case after badgering them forever uh, the I guess war department decided that the best job they could give Ravel was to there's a little bug here so we keep going uh, to drive an ambulance which I think is a pretty gruesome job during the nine months of Verdun, which was one of the most brutal 
and bloody battles. And Ravel did drive this little, you know, <laughs> ambulance and went around delivering medicine and picking up people who were wounded. And it was a pretty gruesome job for him. And he got sick while he was doing it. But shortly before he left, he hastily finished up these six movements of Tombeau de Kukran, as well as the trio, which you will hear. He wrote that in five weeks, which is absolutely amazing because it is such a masterpiece. And in the Tombeau de Kukran, and please add whatever you this like, please. Um, it's made up of six movements. Three movements are dance movements, and those are the three movements that Jeffrey and I chose to play today. And we're gonna split them up, not his right hand and my left, but he's gonna play for God, <laughs> I'm gonna play the minuet, and end with the rigadoon. So it's a little bit out of order, or maybe it's not, I can't tell. But in any case, that's what you're gonna hear first. Um, and then we're gonna move on to Poulenc, and I'm gonna have you speak about the Poulenc. you have something else you wanna add about Tombo? No, this is wonderful. The, the only other thing I would say is just that for those of you that are curious to learn more about the, the origins of the piece, um, Couperin, Francois Couperin, a great French Baroque composer, has a literature of harpsichord pieces that are in several hundreds. There's like over 400 harpsichord pieces. Mm -hmm. So um, many of the, the little ornaments, uh, turns of phrase, even the form of these movements uh, harkens back to Couperin and Rameau, not only Couperin, but, um, but I would definitely encourage you to, to listen to some of that repertoire because um, it gives you an even a richer lens to appreciate uh, Ravel's composition. And Ravel dedicated each movement to a fallen friend or a husband, or there were twin sons, I believe, of some friends who passed away, and one of them I'm playing. And he was criticized roundly for writing cheerful music for dead people. And his response to that was, they're dead. <laughs> you know, what more can I do? I mean, we want to celebrate their lives. And so you might find these pieces oddly cheerful, but nevertheless, they're an homage not just to the people who died, but also of the great composers of the past. So I think that's really uh, what this Tombeau de Couperin is all about.
the remainder of the first half uh, is music written in the year 1918. And it's almost impossible to believe that these two pieces came from the same country uh, in the same year. So different is their response to current events and the climate of the time. Um, so as, as Gwen mentioned, we're going to play Francis Poulenc's sonata for four hands, which is very short, very witty. Uh, he wrote it when he was 19 years old. And um, very much under the influence of Satie and Stravinsky, um, it leans forward to the Roaring Twenties and its kind of popular folksy nature. You'll hear all kinds of city sounds, car horns, um, uh, ridiculous physical comedy in the way that we, that we play the piece together. Uh, and it, it's just a riot. So um, it's in three short movements, Prelude, Rustique, and Finale. And um, we've had a great time rehearsing and playing this piece. So and maybe also I'll just mention in contrast, um, the piece that you'll hear after that, written by Nadia Boulanger, um, as Gwen mentioned, um, was written in memory of her younger sister, who was the first woman to win the Prix de Rome. She was a phenomenally gifted composer, as is Nadia. Um, and the contrast of these two uh, is it, just really phenomenal. Last note about Poulenc I should mention. I have a tiny, tenuous, personal connection. My beloved piano teacher, who grew up in Paris and studied at the conservatoire, um, attended a very, very liberal Catholic church in the 50s in Paris that Poulenc attended. And she told me that she saw him often uh, from a distance. She never had the courage to speak to him. But that's, that's my six degrees of separation. <laughs>
So Nadia Boulanger precedes this short piece um, with a brief poetic text, which we believe she wrote herself. And it translates to something like, in heavy, dark atmospheres, we're infiltrated by doubt and discouragement. But distant sounds, clear and pure, arise. And toward hope for a better life, man walks confidently, tenderly, and gravely.
director and co-director at Color Art Institute. So I'm here to talk with Russ today. And we have a music program today. It's, um, it, the program title is uh, Music at the Time of War. And so I want to talk with Russ about your collection. And I have a question for you. Um, so this music is composed uh, during the World War World War One, just right yes. at the beginning. So I want to ask if, in your collection, are there any artists um, who made art or who experienced the, the World War One or World War Two or any other political conflicts after? Indeed. Uh, so the Great War, which encompassed from 1914 to 1918, uh, involved a tremendous amount of not only people in the arts, but in music and literature, you know, from the, the British, uh, Wilfred Owen and, and Victor Sassoon, along with Maurice Ravel, who was a paramedic, and he was a, cons uh, he was a conscript mm -hmm. for the war. Mm -hmm. So all this brings out of how the war affected so many people, not only directly, but indirectly. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that uh, uh, what the war brought out was more with people, Europeans, and especially Parisians, who left Europe mm -hmm. for America, mm -hmm. like Marcel Duchamp, mm -hmm. you know, who was pretty much settled in. But also, what the war really brought out, and it was not during the actual the war itself, but with all the, the killing and the, the, the just the the destruction that was going on, because this was the beginning of the really the industrialization of military might and power. Mm -hmm. And this what brought out a lot of artists from different sectors throughout Europe, mm -hmm. from Italy and Russia, with all this understanding or really just trying to figure out mm -hmm. where all this is going. Mm -hmm. This is just a, 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 just a tremendous of not only people and, and uh, military might, but the industrial might. And I'm very much uh, 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 an admirer of the, of, of, of the Italian futurism. Mm -hmm. They were questioning during the war and after mm -hmm. what is happening with all these forms of industrialization, mm -hmm. which is changing. Mm -hmm. You know, we haven't had World War II yet, so, but this was the beginning of the harbinger yeah. of all the military might and, and, and equipment mm -hmm. that was utilized, mm -hmm. along with chemical and gas warfare, which was never ever used before. Mm -hmm. And it just, it just destroyed people along with, which we're very familiar with now, with the pandemic. It was the beginning and the onset of the 1917 Spanish flu, mm -hmm. which killed millions. Yeah. So all of these forms came about, but in the art world, throughout uh, uh, the European theater, mm -hmm. not only uh, in terms of, of France be, being uh, observing all this, but also in Germany. Mm -hmm. You know, you had uh, uh, artists like George Gross, you know, who just try to get a sense of what all this is all about. Mm -hmm. And through Dadaism, which Marcel Duchamp was a huge, uh, 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 um, uh, I want to say, uh, one of the, the major founders, but there was many other, along with Hans Richter, poet and writer in Germany. So all of this come together, mm -hmm. and they're trying to figure out what's all happening. So the music did what they could. Mm -hmm. But through art, mm -hmm. which is much more tactile, mm -hmm. uh, utilized through their medium. Mm -hmm. and other forms, because not only the Dadaist movement, along with, with uh, uh, surrealism and other forms, so all these people and, and, and artists came together. Mm -hmm. So I'm very much intrigued, and without that, you don't have mm -hmm. art world, which further uh, advanced mm -hmm. in World War II. Yeah. But yeah. back to World War II, so what that brought up was that it's a continuation. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, I, I would think in terms of the, the, the powers to be and the intellectual forms, in Europe, they're trying to get a sense because they thought this was the ultimate, penultimate war, but it was not. 30 years later, we know, or maybe a little like 20 years later, with all the nationalism that was going on, with Nazism, etc., and fascism, it brought up a bigger war. Mm -hmm. And so this is becoming just a major conflagration, mm -hmm. and the, the mediums of the, of the artists and the musicians mm -hmm. and the poets and writers are trying to make sense of what's all going on. Yeah. So I'm being very late in the game, if you will, as a collector, you know, mm -hmm. late 20th century, mm -hmm. you know, brought up all these uh, 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 military men mm -hmm. who served in the European theater, in the, in the Pacific theater, mm -hmm. and they were there for all this. I have many, many painters mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. from uh, Diebenkorn mm-hmm. to Hassel Smith. These were cartographers. These are some who were infantrymen. Mm-hmm. John Willow was in mm-hmm. Okinawa for two years mm-hmm. fighting the Pacific Front. Mm-hmm. So, you know, these were not uh, people or, you know, who really, and I'm not saying they didn't fight, but I, I knew they had a sense mm-hmm. of humanity. Mm-hmm. So this was very difficult for them. Mm-hmm. And John Willow, as a point of, um, um, uh, of, of avid collector of his work, mm-hmm. you know, he did not have any uh, 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 equipment or tools to paint. Mm-hmm. So he would get whatever found mediums, mm-hmm. coffee grind that was not used, anything he could have because there's no way to get supplies. Mm-hmm. And so he would utilize all this during the downtime. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, war is not fought uh, every day or weekly. It's mm-hmm. fought with battles that the powers, powers to be saying, now we're involved, mm. and but this is something that they witness, mm-hmm. and so they continue to to uh, uh, obviously uh, do what they have what told mm-hmm. by the country, and so with all this, mm-hmm. and after this four years of just incredible horror mm-hmm. that occurred on both uh, side of the uh, the ocean, uh, many of the people that came after uh, World War II decided. You know, because the government had to do something with all these idle people, mm-hmm. and men especially, mm-hmm. and they were given a GI Bill. Mm-hmm. And with this GI Bill, it started the California Fine Arts School mm-hmm. in San Francisco. It was already established, mm-hmm. but they had this huge coterie of additional students mm-hmm. that came in. Mm-hmm. New York had their own with the Student, uh, student League, but the California Fine Arts School mm-hmm. is no uh, secondary school. It was a, a, a major energy mm-hmm. and creativity. Mm-hmm. Now, many uh, teachers from New York came here also, uh-huh. and they did all this. But I have many, many uh, 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 students who, um, mm-hmm. who not only studied there, uh-huh. and they taught there, mm-hmm. and from Demon Cohen to Elm Bischoff, John Grillo, mm-hmm. just a litany of, of, of just people. Mm-hmm. Because if they fought on the Pacific Front, they're going to be in San Francisco. Yeah. And so this is what they did, and they eventually uh, 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 you know, went back east, whatever the case may be, where their home is. Mm-hmm. But a lot of them did also stay here. Mm-hmm. So that was a good thing for, for, for the Bay Area yeah, yeah. and for, yeah. for its art movement to yeah. continue on. So yeah. it's just, a, 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 just an incredible a, a dynamic situation that was going on mm-hmm. that's throughout all this mm-hmm. period. Yeah. And uh, I think that the art uh, movement through all this, and again, um, that's how it, I think the Abstract Expressionists, which was a major movement, not only in New York, but in, in San Francisco Bay Area, mm-hmm. that, that was really fertile mm-hmm. and started this whole movement mm-hmm. of a lot of just incredible creativity mm-hmm. and which you know, went into uh, a, a counterculture of different types of medium mm-hmm. that many different artists did. So it was just an incredible movement. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of obviously social and political mm-hmm. uh, commentary that was made through all this. Mm-hmm. Some took longer than, than before, but, mm-hmm. but eventually that's what it takes. Mm-hmm. You know, Ravel and Stravinsky, like in many in their time, their music was not well received. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was not commercialized, and this happens with all throughout. Yeah. And I know many of painters that I've collected and uh, admired, the same thing. It was poo-pooed and it was derided, <laughs> but you break through all this right. because the art is for what you believe mm-hmm. in the idealism, and that's something that I think is always true to the core mm-hmm. for many, many artists in all different mediums. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's kind of all the reason why you were so intrigued by these artists. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. They set they set the foreground, mm. and it's it's the the primer for everything else that goes on. Mm. And again, and there's many different uh, uh, levels to all this, mm. and but you need this, and for to get any sense of of making sense and, and have some form of the future, yeah. it's the people in the humanities mm. that always is the forefront, mm-hmm. and that says out uh, and. Uh, of course, you know, uh, that's always, uh, uh, you have to have a lot of courage mm-hmm. because ma- majority of these artists, even to, to this day, mm-hmm. they don't do it for, the, for commerce mm-hmm. or financial gains. Mm-hmm. They do it because they believe in this. Mm-hmm. And I truly, truly believe yeah. that that's also something in the past, the present, and the future that we need to support mm-hmm. vigorously because without that, we have nothing. Yeah. We have no soul and we have no spirit and it's being questioned all the time. And so one has to always kind of, uh, I, I, I believe, it's, it's, it's in our innate nature to mm-hmm. always push for that mm-hmm. and to elevate yeah. these mediums. Yeah, so that, that is amazing. Uh, I have one more question kind of in relation to that. So 
in our culture, art, artists and the supporters and patrons kind of goes all hand by hand. And so as like you as a collector in this present time, what do you, how do you see your role? Well, you know, the thing is, I, 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 I'm going to say this. I'm a, I'm a bit of a conservative. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm a student of history. So to say that I collect living or avant-garde artists mm -hmm. would be a misnomer. But it's something that needs to be mm -hmm. further cultivated. Mm -hmm. You know, people like to, uh, you know, and I'm not saying that, that one is somewhat facile about it, but we get kind of lazy. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody tells you, we think that's compelling, that's good. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. in many ways, there's so many artists out there mm -hmm. that we need to promote mm -hmm. and push. Yeah. And not only through the artists, but through the art centers and mm -hmm. I want to say to a certain degree, to the museum also. Even though they're more mature and established, mm -hmm. we need to push this. Mm -hmm. And this is something that has to be done. Mm -hmm. And it has to be really, again, cultivated over and over. Because we lose sight. Mm -hmm. Because we believe what is important is what, is what is in front of you. And we don't have a bigger picture. And this is with many other avenues also. Not only in the arts, but in other fields that we're going through, especially right now. Mm -hmm. So... It's something that I really, really believe that we should all promote.